Canadian Arthur Curry had never commanded anything larger than a militia regiment at the outbreak of war in 1914, but within a few years he rose to be commander of the Canadian Corps and became one of the most respected and ablest generals of the First World War. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to another Great War Bio Special Edition of Who Did What in World War I, today featuring Arthur Curry. He was born December 5, 1875, in the hamlet of Napperton, Ontario, the son of William Garner Curry and his wife Jane. His name at the time was spelled C-U-R-R-Y. The name actually had been Corrigan when his father's parents had emigrated from Ireland in 1838, but they changed it. Arthur would change the spelling in his 20s, supposedly because he didn't like it being equated with the food. In 1904, he took over the agency he'd been working for, but more importantly for us, he was also getting seriously involved in the local militia, which he had joined in 1897. He rose quickly through the ranks and was an avid student of military affairs, taking courses offered by professional soldiers and reading all of the latest military literature. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Curry was commanding the regiment by 1909. When war broke out in 1914, Canada was committed to Britain's war effort as was Curry. At first, Curry was going to assume the post of commanding officer of the British Columbia District where he would be in charge of recruitment and training. This would have allowed Curry to also keep an eye on his finances, which had gone south after a big failure in land speculation. Curry's friends, however, thought he was way too good a soldier to stay at home, and in particular, his friend Garnett Hughes, son of the Minister of Militia and Defense, Sam Hughes, who persuaded his father to find a good post for Curry. And in September 1914, Curry became commander of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade. Curry accepted this position, but not before he took over $10,000 from his militia regiment's funds in order to pay off his debts. As you may imagine, this would come back to haunt him. In October, Curry and his men, some 4,000 strong, went to England, where they would train over the winter, traveling to the continent in February 1915. In April, Curry's brigade was posted to Ypres, just in time for the Second Battle of Ypres. It was there that the Germans first used chlorine gas, opening a hole in the lines. The Canadians were outnumbered and outgunned, but Curry's defense was spirited and solid, and the Canadians fought exceptionally well. And with British reinforcements, the situation was stabilized. This came at a great cost. By early May, when his brigade was relieved, Curry had lost nearly half of his men. Two weeks later at Festubert, Curry's men took a further 1,200 casualties in what was essentially fruitless fighting, which saw scenes like a frustrated Curry pleading in vain with his superior General Alderson to postpone a suicidal frontal assault against entrenched German positions protected by uncut barbed wire. Curry was quite different from most generals in the British and colonial forces. He came from a militia. He was overweight. He did not have a mustache. He was easygoing and was popular with his officers, but not so much with the rest of the men, who found him stiff and pompous. He was not a charismatic leader, even though, as he showed post-war, he was a powerful orator. At war, he was above all concerned with avoiding needless sacrifice on the battlefield, and was an obsessive planner who insisted on adequate protection for the men at the sharp end of an assault. In September 1915, he was promoted to Major General and given command of the 1st Canadian Division. Alderson was soon replaced as commander of the Canadian forces by Sir Julian Bing, a career British officer who was bewildered by his new post. Spoiler alert! In early June 1916, the Germans bombarded and shattered the 3rd Canadian Division at Mount Sorel. Whole platoons were killed to a man. The counterattack was a failure, and Bing turned to Curry to regain the lost ground. But Curry would not be rushed and took 10 days to marshal his artillery and have his infantry practice their coming tasks. They launched a night assault on the 13th. The Canadians cleared the enemy lines and took back most of the ground. This was the first important and large-scale attack by the Canadians of the war, was a rousing success, and the British command took notice. In September, Curry and his men joined the ongoing carnage of the Battle of the Somme. Although the Canadian Corps won a victory at Courcelette on the 15th, they fell by the thousands in the killing grounds before the battle was called off in mid-October. Both Bing and Curry 
thought things seriously had to change, so Bing commissioned Curry to do a thorough study of the battle and of the French Battle of Verdun. Curry's report contained two key recommendations, that control over the infantry must be decentralized and that heavy artillery was absolutely needed to support the infantry. At the Somme, operations had been impossible to call off or change once they were set in motion days before at command headquarters, and men often found themselves attacking into uncut barbed wire. The troops were now trained to be more flexible and independent, so they could assume other roles if their comrades were killed. Also, heavy emphasis was put on artillery and infantry coordination. The next major target for the Canadians was Vimy Ridge, held by the Germans since 1914. On April 9, 1917, at 5.30 a.m., the attack on Vimy Ridge began. The battle was long and hard and was actually orchestrated primarily by Bing, but by the end of the day, the result was clear. The Canadians had won a stunning victory and emerged from the battle with a reputation as shock troops. Now, I'm not actually going to go over the individual battles Curry's men fought now. I'll do that in our regular episodes when we get to them. But let's just say that by that summer, Sir Henry Sinclair Horn, commander of the British First Army, said, The 1st Canadian Division is the pride and wonder of the British Army. Bing was promoted to Army Command, and in June, Arthur Curry was knighted and took command of the Canadian Corps as Lieutenant General. In three years, he'd gone from commanding a small militia to war hero with 100,000 men at his disposal. Over the rest of the war, Curry's men, the Canadians, fought in battle after battle, indeed had a long string of successes, but of course at a huge cost in men. All of this will be covered in our show in the years to come. I'm sorry to be a jerk about it and not say anything here. One thing I will say here is that Curry's financial shadiness came to light in 1917, and the Canadian cabinet was a bit concerned that their big hero was one court case away from being branded a felon. Curry borrowed money to pay back his theft, but left several ministers in Ottawa wondering about the character of their great leader. So, post-war. On August 23, 1919, Sir Arthur Currie was appointed Inspector General of the Militia Forces in Canada. He left that position in May 1920 to become Principal and Vice-Chancellor of McGill University, a position he held until his death in November 1933. Sir Arthur Currie is widely considered one of the ablest generals on either side during the First World War. His emphasis on meticulous planning and preparation and his recognition of artillery's importance to trench warfare no doubt helped to shorten the war, and his soldiers enjoyed a well-deserved reputation as crack troops. As you may imagine, he remains a Canadian hero to this day. This was, like all of our bios, just a brief look, and I encourage you all to look up Arthur Curry to learn more about him, particularly his battles in 1917 and 1918. If you'd like to see more about the Canadian effort in World War I, you can check out our special about Canada right here. For more background information about World War I, like us on Facebook or join the discussion on our subreddit. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.